But tonight I want to talk about something a little bit different. And uh, I want to begin, I want to ask you, uh, some of you may have, some of you may not. Have you ever had a passport? Maybe you have one now. But you know, a passport, you know, where it's, it's an interesting thing, the passport. Uh, you don't have to have one in America. But if you go outside of America to anywhere outside of America, you got to have a passport. Right. I don't have a passport. Never had to go get one. But I've talked to many people who have and have said they had a passport. Anytime you visit a foreign land, you have to have a passport. That's your documentation that shows who you are, where you belong to. It shows that you're not from that country. You're from the United States of America. A lot of people don't want that passport. But I'm telling you, I wouldn't have a passport from any other country than the United States. Because some of these people that say they don't want to be in America, they need to go over there. And they'll realize they want to come to America. Maybe they won't want to leave then. But if you have a passport, on that passport it tells who you are, it tells what nation you belong to, it tells your information, and as soon as you get to that country, you've got to present that passport. And in that passport, there's something that most people don't like, and it's a picture. <laughs> it's a picture of you. And... and you know, I've never heard anybody say, I love my passport picture. Hey, we need a picture for the newspaper. Let me get my passport. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do a celebration of you. Let me get my passport picture. I've never heard that. I read a story about a woman. She went to get a passport, and, and, and she was renewing it. And I believe it's every 10 years you have to renew it. And, and, and they, she had to give her old passport, and they gave her the new one. She picked up her old one, and she looked at it. And she laid it down and picked up the new one and looked at it. And she said, I sure do like that picture better than I like this new picture. Yeah. And the man behind the counter looked there and he says, yeah, but 10 years from now, you'll like that picture better than the one then. <laughs> and I thought that was funny. So I looked up some other, uh, some other things. And these are just a couple of comments that I've saw, I saw uh, on the web as I looked up what people say about their, their passports. And one person said this. They said, I look like a convicted and unrepentant mass murderer. <laughs> I'm scared to get a passport. <laughs> I don't know if it's in the camera. I don't know if it's what it is. But apparently, they don't do very good pictures there. I know when I took my driver's license, they was like, one, two, click. I said, where's three? They said, we've already done it. You don't need to worry about it. I was like, I was like this. You know, I was like, getting ready. I wanted to do the smolder. Instead, it looked like the smother. <laughs> Another person online wrote, on my passport, I look like a very happy pig. Oh. I don't know. I may look like that anyway. But here's the thing. Whether you like your passport picture or not, whether you think you look strange or weird or different or you, you hate it, it, doesn't look, it, it looks weird, you look like a pig, I don't know. You better look like the picture in your passport. Right. Yeah. Because when you get to that other country and you hand it to them and they open it up, if it doesn't look like you, you're going to be in trouble. Because from what I understand, they won't let you in their country if they can't identify you. And you're not coming back here if they can't identify you. And so you have to look like your passport, whether you like the picture, whether you would look better 20 years ago in it. I, I'd love to have my driver's license when I was 16. But if you don't look like your picture, you're not going to get very far. That's right. And I want to talk to you tonight about a passport that Peter tells us about. In 1 Peter, he talks about our passport. He calls us strangers in this land. He calls us yes. foreigners. Yes. And I want to talk to you for just a moment about that passport. Peter describes the picture that appears in our passport as Christians that the world will look for. A picture that Peter insists we must look like. Because if you don't look like that picture, you're not going to make it very far for Jesus. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people out there that are claiming to be Christians. They're not in church tonight. They weren't in church this morning. They won't be in church Wednesday night. They won't be in church next week. But, you know, come Christmas, they'll be in church. Next Easter, they'll be in church. And, 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 I, and I, I've always, I boldly make that statement every Easter and Christmas. I say, it's good to see you. We'll see you next Christmas. Maybe that's why I'm not pastoring anymore. (laughs) 
But I think you can all think about someone who claims to have a passport as a Christian and they don't look like what the Bible says. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. You see, the, the picture is our passport in this world. The picture tells people not only who we are, but whose kingdom we belong to. Let me tell you something. When you pull out that passport and it says United States of America, they look at you and they say, oh, you're, you're an American. In some places they look down on it. some places they look up and, 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 and are glad to see an American. But there's no doubt when it comes to it. And if you get in the country, we had some friends that were in Paris a couple of years ago when all the rioting and all the, the terrorist attack happened. They were in the hotel looking down on the shootings in the, in the, the street below them. They're from Dixon. And they were watching this happen and, and Facebooking about it, because that's what we do as Americans. And you know what? They, the, the government came in and got them and took them out in the midst of all this. I'm glad that I have a pa that I don't have one, but if I went, I had a password, passport that says, I'm an American, get me out of here. And the United States government said, you're an American, you don't belong, let's get you out of here. I want to tell you something tonight. As a Christian, we have a passport that says not only who I am, but it says I belong to the kingdom of God. Amen. I belong to Jesus. I belong to, I'm not like this world. I'm not one of these people. I'm not a sinner. I'm not a, I'm a belong to Jesus. And I can call on Jesus when the enemy comes, when I'm under attack. And I can say, I'm a Christian. Here's my passport. Wow. And God says, yes. And he comes and he pulls us out. But here's the thing. You can claim to have that passport, but if you don't look like the picture that's in it. There's so many people that when they cry out to God, God, bless me, God, help me, God. And God's like, I don't know you. Now some would say, well, that's not true. God knows everybody. Yeah, he knows who you are. But there's, not a, di there's a difference in knowing who you are and knowing you. I know a lot of kids and who they are. And there's a lot of people on my Facebook that I know who they are. But there's only a few that I know personally because I talk to them. I, I, I have a conversation with them. I have, I have a relationship with them. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. Your, re, your passport doesn't need to just be another picture. It needs to be a, a relationship. It needs to be when God looks at it, he recognizes you and he says, yes, this is my child. Yes. Amen. Your passport needs to show not only who you are, but whose kingdom you belong to. Yeah. And here's the thing. And this is the hard part. Everybody knows what that picture on your Christian passport is supposed to look like. Oh, yeah. Amen. That's not easy. Mm -hmm. I've preached this for years. I preach it to kids. I preach it to teenagers. You have to look like a Christian if you call yourself a Christian. Right. Yeah. Because the worst witness you can have is to show up to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night in youth group and go out there and cuss or go out there and drink or go out there and party or go out there and do things that are not godly you have to look like that picture and so first peter tells us let me let me illustrate like this and i, I want you to I, I want you to understand not only this because i think we get this decent but there's another side of it i had a friend whose boss got upset with her got mad at her cussed her out screamed at her yelled at her you, you've been there yeah. we've all had bosses like that it wasn't my friend's fault why he was yelling at her why he was cussing at her but the whole time this boss was cussing at her he, he, he was just berating her and just putting her down. And, 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 and all of a sudden, he started cussing and he started using God's name in vain. And my friend got offended. My friend is a Christian. She's, I don't understand why he's doing this. And she was telling me this. And I asked her this question. I said, does your boss go to church? She said, no. I said, is your boss a Christian? She said, I don't think so. Not by the way they live. I said, then why shouldn't they cuss at you? Yeah. Why shouldn't they talk with that language why shouldn't they do this now I understand it wasn't her fault the reason that he was yelling at her, but why why would you expect anything different of them because you see that boss doesn't belong to Jesus that boss doesn't ask uh, look to God for approval or acceptance that boss is only acting the only way that boss knows how to act that they're acting the only way that they can act because they don't belong to Jesus and we all know people like that I've said it myself why don't them people just straighten up if you watch the news, you're going to look at it and say, why don't them people just straighten up? Yeah. I mean, I don't care if it's the, the Congress or the leadership or, 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 or local leadership or just people on the street, people at Walmart. Yeah. I'm sorry if you work at Walmart. I'm not sorry that you work there. It's a good job. But I, I'm not trying to pick on Walmart. 
But the people at Walmart, man, they're a handful. And when I go in Walmart, sometimes I think, now, what is wrong with people? Yeah. Especially after 9, 10 o'clock at night. Amen, Shelly? Yeah. Shelly can testify about that. And I'm telling you, so there's some people out there, and I look at them and say, why in the world are they this way? Don't they understand? I've got some family members that I don't understand, and I look at them and I say, you know better. You were raised in church. I've got a cousin that told me, I'm going to a homosexual church. I said, what in the world is a homosexual church? He said, the pastor's homosexual, and there's a lot of homosexual people in it, and they preach that Jesus loves them and Jesus saves. I said, but I didn't know what to say. I said, but wasn't your granddad a pastor? Didn't you grow up in an assembly? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I just believe now that, and I, and I, I said, why? I said, I could not understand it. Yeah. But it simply comes down to this. They do not know Jesus they don't belong to Jesus. You see, they live by their human moral compass instead of a spiritual, biblical moral compass. You see, people that don't live for Jesus have made themselves the God in their lives. They set their compass on what's right and wrong. They set their compass on good and bad. They belong to themselves. They answer only to themselves. We get so upset by others' behavior sometimes when we should be concerned with where they're going to spend eternity. Right. That's it. Let me say that again. We get so upset with others' behavior sometimes yeah. when we should be more upset and concerned about where they're going to spend eternity. Yeah. We all know people, we all have people in our lives that, man, we're just frustrated because they're so evil, because they're so mean, because they're so negative. And we just can't get over it. But we should be more concerned about their soul. We should be more concerned about where they're going to spend eternity. You see, the disease of sin and the result of that sin will be an eternity in hell. Yeah. We should be more offended by that sin than the behavior that they show. Right. And until we come to grips with that, that, these people don't need more morality. They need Jesus. Yeah. And that's the bottom line. You see, the world isn't holy because the world isn't redeemed. And I want to tell you, the world's not getting any holier either. And I'm, it saddened me. We were talking about this before service tonight. This world is getting bad. It's get, I mean, I'm not as old as some here, but I've seen some changes in the past five, ten years. It scares me to think about the world that my kids are going to have to live in. I mean, I can remember, you know, I talk about in youth, I talk about the 80s all the time because I grew up in the 80s and a lot of cool stuff from the 80s. But since the 80s, a lot of things have changed. And these kids face things every day that we never dreamt of facing. I mean, there's things out there that they can trip up that can stumble them, and it's all right here. I'm not against phones. I'm not against smartphones. But I'm telling you, these kids can do more on this phone. Those little girls right there can do more on this phone than I could do with everything I had yeah. when I was their age. Those little seven, eight-year-old girls. I mean, and that scares me. Because if it's changed that much, yeah. imagine when they're 27, 28 years old. Because, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, I, can, I, can, I could right here, I could pull up any pornography. I could pull up any dirty, filthy nastiness within seconds on this right. phone. Yeah. Right. Somebody text me. Look at that. In church, because they're not at church. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the world is not getting any better. And so the thing about us is, as Christians, and Peter, and we're going to talk about this, Peter gives us a description of what our picture in our passport, because he says we're foreigners. And I thank God I'm not of this world. I thank God this is not my home. Amen. And the only hope I have, as I was telling you that story of this boss, is that I don't have to worry about that. Because one day Jesus is coming back for me, and he's going to take me to a place that's perfect, right. where I don't have to listen to that. I don't have to endure that anymore. And when he comes back for me, I have to look like a Christian. I have to be one. I tell you today, the church is the light and the darkness. The church has to recognize the need to be different. You and I have to recognize the, the need to not look like the world. Because the world is in darkness and we are the light. Right. We can't blend in. We have to be different. I'm going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1. If you want to turn there with me. 
I've got four things real quick tonight that Peter tells us about and some instructions he gives us that will help our passport picture, that will help us to look more like Christians, to look more like Jesus than like the world. Wow. You know what? I love Peter. Peter was the biggest transformation in history. Yeah. You know what? Peter wasn't a mass murderer or anybody horrible. We, we, we love stories like that where somebody was a murderer and they got saved. We, we love, I, I, I see on Facebook all the time. I don't know if you're on Facebook. I don't really post on it. Just, I just read. Um, some people call it creeping. I just like reading what everybody else puts. And, and there's some, every morning when I get up, I flip through and I have to scroll through, you know, minutes and minutes and minutes of other people posting stories because I don't read all of them. But I've seen a few here lately where some transgender, uh, you know, homosexual, transgender, and, and, and all this has gotten saved and transformed their lives. And now they're preaching. I, I saw uh, where there, just this morning there was someone that was demon possessed and living for the devil. And he was tattooed and pierced all over. And, I mean, he looked, he looked evil. But he got saved. And now he's preaching for Jesus. And I love those stories. But Peter, I think, was the greatest transformation in history because Peter was, was no... no Man, he didn't, he, nothing went through his mind that he didn't speak. Matter of fact, I think a lot of what he spoke didn't even go through his mind. And when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was writing all this down, they were like, Peter's a gold mine. They just waited for him to say something so they could write it down. You don't read a lot about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but you read a lot about Peter. And they probably woke up every day, man, get your notebook because here comes Peter. But Peter was quick to speak out. He was quick, and that's why I like Peter, because I'm quick to speak sometimes, and sometimes i got to stop and think about it. But Peter would speak, and, and Peter was this, oh, I'm a great Christian. I'm, I love Jesus. I, I'm, I'm the best disciple. I'm the greatest. And, and, and Jesus looked at him and said, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. Peter's like, I don't understand what you're talking about, but I will never do that. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you, Jesus. I'm, I'm the best. I walked on the water with you. Man, I, I handed out more fish and loaves that day than anybody else. I mean, I was there. I was ready to go. I, I, man, I, I, man, I'm just, whoo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then when it came down to being serious, yeah. not only did he deny Jesus, but he cussed. Yeah. He cursed him. I don't know that man. Yeah. And he ran off in shame. But then Jesus came to him and said, do you love me? Of course I love you. I love you more than anything. You understand the state that Peter was in when Jesus walked up to him and said, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. He was hurt. He was broken. Yeah. His, his Messiah, his Savior, his best friend, he had denied him yeah. when he needed him the most. And he was hurt. And Jesus said, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, I love you. You know that I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. Not only did he ask him to go feed his sheep, but he gave him the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. And when the yeah. Holy Spirit came upon Peter, he wasn't afraid anymore of what somebody thought about him. He wasn't afraid of anything anymore. He all of a sudden had the boldness to stand up and thousands yeah. got saved. Right. Amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't save thousands. Yeah. But Peter stood up and preached to thousands. Yeah. That was the greatest transformation. And so Peter is telling us what he has learned from Jesus himself. And so he's writing here in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. He, he gives us, I believe, four things that we need to understand when we look at our passport. When we say, am I in this world? I'm not of this world. I need to be different than this world. I don't need to look like this world. And when I'm traveling through, I need to have a passport that says, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a person of the world. I'm a, I'm a man, I'm born again of Jesus Christ. Amen. Number one that he says, the first thing he says this is a simple one, but it's, it's so powerful. He says, you must live as God's obedient children. Yeah. In verse 14, he says, so you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. Yeah. Yeah, you it. didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. Yeah. I like what he says there. He says, don't slip back into your old ways. Peter's just talking here. He's not given preacher language. No. He says, you must live as God's obedient children. He says, you didn't know any better before you got saved. That's right. I'm telling you, if you come to know Jesus, you can't expect your behavior to change instantly because you may not have known any better. We have kids come into church that they don't know how to behave. Right. Uh -huh. I was talking to Jonathan while going, he said, our kids that back there are pretty well behaved. I said, they're church kids. 
I said, wait, do we start running that bus and bring in kids from the apartments, bring in kids from the street? Yeah. I said, then you want 15 adults back here to help you. Because they won't know how to behave. And you can't expect them to know how to behave in church because some of them have never been to church. Peter says, you didn't know any better before. But now you do. He says, don't slip back into that behavior before. Your passport has changed. Your picture has changed. It don't look like what it did a few months ago. It looks totally different now. And I'm telling you, every 10 years, you get that passport renewed. Let me tell you, every time you come to this church house, and you lift your hands up and you worship God. And every time you come to these altars and you pray, your picture changes. Because you're not going to leave. If you're truly worshiping God and you're truly spending time in these altars, you're not going to leave here like you came. Amen. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Amen. I feel like singing. Amen. I knew a minister when I was a kid, Brother Langley. He was old then. He's passed on now. But he told me way, way back years ago, he worked at a sawmill. Same, I worked at that sawmill eventually when I grew up, but when I was a kid, he was telling me about this. He said, I got saved at a tent revival one night back in, I mean, years and years ago, back when they still had the old tent revivals. We had them when I was a kid, but this was a long time before that. He said, I got saved one, one week night, and I went to work the next morning, and I was driving my little machine that I was driving, and this guy walked by, and my buddy, and he said, he hollered off and let out a line of cuss words at me, and I just responded back with the same amount of cuss words and everything that I had always done before. He said, that was our thing. That's how we talked. And some of you have been in jobs like that. That's the language. And he said, I just laid into him like I always did. He said, and instantly the Holy Spirit convicted me of what I said. He said, you don't talk like that anymore. He said, you're a child of God now. You see, his passport had changed. And so he said, I had to stop. He says, I drove around behind something by myself, and I got down on the ground and got on my knees, and I cried out to God to forgive me of what I had just said and done. He said, then I got back on that machine, and I drove to find that man. I got off that machine, and I stood in front of him, and I said, please forgive me. He says, I gave my heart to Jesus last night. He says, and I don't want to talk like that, and I'm sorry. And he apologized to that man. That man said, I don't know what, he said, he didn't know what to expect. He went to church with him the next night and got saved himself. <laughs> Then that man preached for 50 years or more. But you see, his picture had changed. Yeah. And he, he couldn't live like he did before. He had to live as God's obedient children. He didn't know any better what he was saying before. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the moment of salvation, at that moment where he changed, all of a sudden he had to act differently. We've been talking about purity in youth. Now, I know when I say purity, everybody thinks of sexual purity. But we're not just, that's, that's one topic of purity. Right. We're talking about living pure lives, holy lives. Yeah. And when these kids go back to school, I don't want them going back like they did when they left school in May. Right. Amen. I want them to go back in pure and holy. Yeah. I want their passport to have changed, the picture to have changed. You see, one of the things we're talking about is, is purity is conforming our minds to Christ. Right. It begins here. We have to clean our minds up. And that's what Peter's saying. You didn't know any better before, but now you must be holy in everything you do because God says, because I'm holy, you must be holy your passport says you're a child of God. You've got to be holy like God. Right. It's got to change, and you've got to live as God's obedient children. Number two, you've got, it says you will answer for what you will do. And verse 17 says, and remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. Right. That is so good to hear. God has no favorites. Right. He loves you just as much as he loves Billy Graham. Yes. Right. I'll tell you something. Some people think God don't love me very much. God don't have favorites. His love for you is as great as it is for the person on the other side of the world. I don't care if you're a pastor or a preacher, if you got saved five minutes ago. God loves you as much as he does anybody else. And he goes on, he says, he will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents, or some verse says as foreigners in this land. You see, God is going to judge or reward you I don't like to think judge because I'm living for God. I believe God's going to reward me for what I do. Right. See, if I sit in fear of judgment, yeah. then I'd, I'd worry about the time. We've been talking about some of the kids. They, they've been coming down a lot to get saved. You know, we, we see that in youth. We see it in kids' church. They, they come all the time because they're afraid that they're not. I don't, I, don't, I don't live that way anymore. Now I live. I want God to reward me, and I want it to be great, not for my glory, but for his glory, right. but because of the things that I did. The Bible says it's going to give us a crown that's jeweled according to our deeds. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we're going to take that crown because it's not my crown. Right. 
And we're going to throw it at the feet of Jesus. Yes. And I want, I, I used to tell the youth this, and they looked at me like crazy. I said, when I take my crown off, I want to throw it up there, and it go, boom. Yeah. And Jesus says, oh, Jason's here. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. I don't want that old crown. What, am I, what do I need a crown for? I'm living on streets of gold. Right. Yeah. I don't need them jewels. But I want Jesus to say, hey, I remember some of the things you did. Yeah. Man, they're awesome. But I want to tell you something. The same way, I don't want to stand before him and take off a little tin crown that goes ding, ding, ding. Because <laughs> Peter says that I will be rewarded according to what I do. Right. Now, my mama's a prayer warrior. My mama, she'll come and visit. She hadn't visited here yet, but when she does and the Holy Spirit starts moving, if you're sitting in front or behind her in the pew, move. <laughs> don't, I don't care if you're on the other end of the pew. You better get up and move because when the Spirit hits her, she's going to get up and move, and she, her arms start swinging like this, and she crawdads. So she don't know who's behind her. And when she hits the aisle, you better not be in the aisle. <laughs> I'm not joking. She may not do as much as she used to because she's not as physically you know, powerful as she used to be. But when we were kids, we said, when the Spirit starts moving like it does in our worship, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God moves. Yeah. When the Spirit starts moving, you got under the pew with my mama. Because she would knock your head off. She didn't care. My mama was a prayer where I'd walk in her room in the middle of the night, and she'd be laid on her side like this, and that arm stuck straight up there. And you get closer until you could hear her praying. And I said, what in the world? And she was praying in the Spirit. See, she was interceding for me, probably more than my brother and sister because I needed it more. But she was in her, she was praying. My mama's a prayer warrior. She's, she had taught me more about living for Jesus, more about following the leading of the Holy Spirit. But you know, when I get to heaven, I can't say, Sherry, that's my mom over there. Yeah, I'm her son. Let me tell you, there was a time I could go to the district office and say, yeah, I'm Sherry Lamb's son. And brother Cargill would say, oh, yeah, I know your mama. She's, she's a minister. She's credentialed. She's a pastor. I know your mama. When I get to heaven, I can't say, that's my mama. That's my granddad over there. Hey, that's my grandma. Yeah. She can quote the Bible to you because she's read it so many times. I have her Bible on my shelf. It's worn smooth out. Yeah. You know, when I get to heaven, I can't say, hey, that's, so, that's my pastor over there. Right. Amen. You know, I can't say that because he's going to look at me and say, who are you? Right. You see, my picture can't be a picture of somebody else. Right. It has to be a picture of me. And it has to reflect, reflect Christ in me. Because you will answer for what you do. Yes. Now before we go to number three, I want you to listen to this next verse. Verse 18. It says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the sinless Spotless Lamb of God. Yes, See, I couldn't make a point out of that one, but I wanted to read it. Yes. God saved me. He gave me a passport. Not, I didn't buy it with gold. I didn't buy it with I can't buy it. I, all the money in the world won't buy it. Right, amen. It was bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. And that's why it's so important to me that my passport reflects Jesus because it was bought with the blood of Jesus. Yes. Number three, Jesus has given you a new life. Verse 21 says, Though cr through Christ you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God, because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart, for you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. I want to tell you tonight, we're no longer slaves to sin. Amen. Let me say that again. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Amen. I'm not bound to what my dad did. I'm not bound to what my grandpa did. I'm not bound to what my great-grandpa did. The sin that was in his life, the alcoholism. My granddad died of alcohol, of alcoholism. His liver exploded because of all the alcohol he consumed his life. But I'm not bound to that. No. I don't have to deal with that. I'm not even tempted to drink alcohol. On well, my dad's side of the family, there's a bunch of alcoholics, but I'm not even tempted because I'm not bound to that because the blood of Jesus has set me free from that. I'm no longer bound to that. 
Let me tell you, I'm no longer a part of this world. I don't have to endure this world. I don't have to listen to this world. I don't have to live like this world. I worked in a plant one time in a sawmill. It was the same sawmill I was telling you about the minister before. And, I, and it's a lot different now than it was when he was there. But I operated a machine, and as long as that machine was running, I sat there and watched it. But when it quit running because of whatever reason the line stopped, we had to find something to do. We had to find somewhere to hide is what we had to do. And there was a man that operated the machine next to me. And he would... He would and so I'd walk over to him, and there was nothing but filth and, and nastiness come out of his mouth. And I, I just got where I ignored him. He'd be waving me over, and I'd just ignore him. I'd find something. I'd go sweep outside in the heat rather than listen to him. Because I don't have to listen to that. I don't have to do that. I don't have to be a part of that. I'd go in the break room, and it'd be the same chatter in the break room. I'd get up and go outside. I'd rather stand outside with the smokers than sit in that air-conditioned break room. Because I don't have to listen. I'm not bound to that. I remember when I was in college, I, some of my friends would go eat every day, and we'd go eat lunch, and, and one day they got to chattering that nasty talk, and I got up and left the table. We was at KFC, and I went and sat at a different table, and they said, what are you doing? I said, I just don't want to hear that language. They knew I was a Christian. They knew I was even preaching at that time. They knew what was going on. I just went and sat down, and they stopped talking. I said, you don't have to stop. I just don't have to sit and listen to it. I don't have to be a part of that. I'm no longer a part of this world. Jesus has given me a new life. I can walk in that new life. I can walk in that freedom. I can walk knowing that I don't have to endure that. Right. And you know what? The thing about it is I want to bring as many of them as I can with me. Yeah. But if they're not willing to come with me, I'm going to walk anyways. Right. Amen. Jesus has given you a new life. Number four. Number four. In order to have your picture look right on your passport in this world, you've got to live that new life that Jesus has given you. Pure and holy. Yes. See, it's one thing to be given a picture. It's one thing to have a passport. There's a lot of people, and, and you know, so you, you hear the news and you see as much as I do, they take their passport and they go to another foreign country and they can act like they're not a, an American. They can, they can deny America. They can say they don't want to have anything. They better have a passport when they get there. And it's going to say United States of America on it. Right. Unless they get some other paper, some visa or something. But they can deny it. They can, they can, they can say all they want to but they're still an American. Right. You know, I'm proud to be an American. Yes. Amen. And like I said earlier, if I go over and get in trouble, I want America to come and save me and protect me. But I'm telling you, because you've been given a passport, just because you come to this altar and you pray, and you say that sinner's prayer, just because God cleans you up, just because he gives you a new life that's been bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus, just because he heals you. I want to give a testimony tonight. Last weekend, we went to Tulsa and did some clothes shopping for, the school, for uh, kids for back to school. We took them ice skating. I've never been ice skating in my life. I live in Oklahoma. We don't have ice here. I grew up in southern Oklahoma. We fish in the water year-round. We don't, we don't have ice. We went to the ice skating rink, and we, we strapped on them boots. And, and I'll tell you, I went to a doctor a few months ago. It might have been last year, and they took an x-ray. My foot was hurting. I have a, a bone spur right there. Right on my Achilles, right on the back of my heel. And it's given me fits for a year or two. I put them boots on, and them hard plastic boots that, for the ice skates, as soon as I put my foot in, it just rubbed on that, that spur. And I'm telling you, I, I almost cried. It hurt. All the rest of that day, all day Saturday, I couldn't walk because it hurt so bad. It, I don't know if it, what it did to it, but it, man, it hurt. Sunday morning. I come up here and I walk from the church over to the youth building. I did this the whole way because it hurts so bad. But during worship, pastor said, he said, I want you to come down. Remember we lined up across yeah. the front of here? Yeah. And we stood and we just worshiped. He didn't say if you need healing. He didn't say if there's something wrong. He just said, I feel like we need to spend time in God's presence. Yeah. And I stood down here, about right in here somewhere, and I stood there and I just worshiped God. And when I walked out of this building, there wasn't a pain in my foot. Yeah. I hadn't felt a pain in my foot all week long. It hadn't hurt one time. I've put on every shoe I've got in my closet trying to make it hurt. It won't hurt. I can't make it hurt. I should have worn my cowboy boots because I can't wear them when it hurt me because when it's in place. I, it, it didn't hurt. God healed me. I didn't ask him for it. I didn't, I didn't come in here with the purpose of getting healed. God healed me because I worshipped him. God healed me because I came to this church 
And I honored my passport. And when pastor said, come down here and worship, I'm going to tell you something. When pastor stands up here and says, y'all come to the altar, you need to get in the altar. If you're physically able of getting to this altar, get in this altar. Because if your shepherd is leading you to the altar, that's where you need to be. I'm preaching to the wrong crowd because y'all all, y'all are in the altar. I know sometimes you have to turn around and kneel or sit at your seat, and that's perfectly fine. But I'm telling you, when your pastor says, do it, you better do it. Because God is going to do something. I don't believe there's anything that man stands up here and says that he hadn't already prayed about and 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 prayed about. Sometimes we think our pastors just come in and just make up stuff on the spot. I promise they don't. Sometimes a story will pop in their head that they tell. But if, he, if he's lo- leading you to the altar, that's where you need to be. Yeah. Number four, live that new life, pure and holy. It says in, in chapter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. Now that you have a, had a taste of the Lord's yeah. kindness. So we have to live our new life pure and holy. And we're given that picture. Yeah. And like I said, I mean, this is, this is so fundamental. You come to this altar tonight, you're getting a new picture. You won't leave here like you did this morning. Right. Man, this morning service was great. Yeah. God's provision. Yeah. Man, I could hear that preached all day, every day. God has provided for me so many times in so many ways. And when Pastor stood down here this morning and he said, some of you have gotten a check you weren't expecting. We got a check this week we weren't expecting. I said, did I tell him about that? Yeah, I'll I'll finish in a minute. You're getting ahead of me. (laughs) We got a check. We paid too much on our escrow. And when they took our insurance out, they said, you paid too much. Here's some money. Praise God. Then a few days later, Jill's doing the bills, and she says, this is not what I budgeted for the electric bill. Wait a minute, the gas bill was paid, and we don't owe any money, and we're not going to owe any money next month. And, 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 and something else, I forget what the other bill was. I said, that's God. Yeah. God's providing. Yeah. Pastor's sitting here, and he's reading my mail to me. <laughs> and he's telling me the blessings that God is, it's like he's been looking over my shoulder all week and writing no notes. God's provision is great yes, it is. for those who live pure and holy. Right, amen. Let me tell you something. I, I can't remember if I preached on it here. I think I did one, one of the first times I preached here. But in Matthew 6, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right. Yes. So we like to leave that part out. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Yeah. Man, so many people do that. Why doesn't God bless me? I ask him for it. Because you're not seeking his righteousness. See, our passport has to reflect. That picture has to reflect his holiness. It has to reflect a pure life. And when we walk, we have to walk in that righteousness of God. And then God's going to provide everything. I didn't ask him for an extra check this week. I didn't have to. I didn't ask him for those bills. I I forget why they were. Something, deposits and this and that, I don't know. But in the hottest month of the year when our electric bill is... God cut our bill in half. I didn't ask him to do that. I didn't have to ask him to do that. Because when he looked at my passport, he saw that I'm his child, and he said, my child. See, God promised to me a long time ago. He even wrote it in the book. He says that I'll open the windows of heaven and pour a blessing on you, and you won't be able to contain it. I got a check just a couple days ago. I think it was Thursday. From a church I'd preached at months ago. And they sent me a check. We didn't get a check from them then. But they sent me a check. They said, we sent it to the wrong address. We sent it to your old address. They sent it back to us. And so we got it. I wasn't expecting that. God has opened the windows of heaven. But he'll, and I'm telling you, he'll do it for you. Pastor Priestley, I'm not trying to re-preach his message. But I'm trying to tell you, if your passport, if your picture reflects that. If it doesn't look like the world, because you don't belong to this world. See, God's not going to bless the world because they don't belong to Him. God's going to bless you because you belong to Him. And if you belong to Him, your picture, your passport should reflect it. You should look like it. Dennis, if you and Julie would come on up. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, I'm going to 
I'm putting this little spin on this. You see, if we belong to Jesus, we need to know that living holy lives, this is what 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, we are not our own. Right. We were bought at a price. Yes. And therefore, we should honor God with not only our bodies, but our entire being. Yes. You see, I, I'm no longer chasing. So many people are trying to get by on themselves. I'm not chasing. You know me as chasing. Chasing's a pretty cool guy. But I'm telling you, I'm a son of God. Right. I'm a child of God. Yes. I'm joint heirs with Jesus. Yes. And I can show you my passport, and it reflects that. Yeah. And I hope yours reflects that, too. You don't belong to this world. I don't, I, you know, my last name is Lamb. If I was Viking, it would be Johnson, because I'm son of John. But, you know, I don't have to live like John. Right. I don't have to live like my granddad. I don't have, because I am a child of God, I don't belong to this world. I belong to Jesus. I'm actually a stranger in this world. Right. Some people say, you're stranger than most people we know. <laughs> but I'm telling you, that's okay. Yeah. Because if you're setting a standard according to what the world looks like, and you're calling me strange because I don't look like it, that's fine with me. Yeah. I don't want to be normal. Right. I tell the youth all the time, I want to be a little different. And they say, you are a little different, but I want you to be different. I don't want you to go to school and try to fit in with the way everybody in school looks. I want you to go to school and then want to look at you and try to be you. Because you don't belong to this world. Because you're strangers in this world. Because you're just passing through this world. Man, I'm so thankful this is not my home. I'm thankful this is not my home. I'm just passing through. The Bible says that God limited our number of years to 120. I hope he gives me all 120. Yeah. Because, you know, if I just got 80, well, then, then I can't keep reaching people. I can't keep preaching about Jesus. I can't keep sharing. I want all 120, Lord. The Lord's probably telling me you need to lose a little weight. You need to eat better. I believe in divine healing. That's one of the 16 fundamental doctrines that Sister Vonda was talking about the other night. Divine healing. We believe in that. The Son of the God. And I thank God that he still heals. I may need it. I thank God that the doctor can take the, my heart out of my chest and put it on the table and work on it and then put it back in. Yeah. I may need that because I want all my 120 years on this earth lest the Lord comes back because I want to share the love of Jesus. I want to preach the message of the cross. But as long as I'm here, I want you to understand I'm not of this world. Yeah. I'm not, this is not my home. I'm going on somewhere else. Yeah. I don't want to stay here. I don't want to look like this world. I don't want to reflect this world. If you travel to a third world country, I have a friend of mine. They came from a third world country to America. And I, and I apologized one time to him from my hometown where we was at because we were driving through a rough area. And I said, I'm sorry that you have to see this part of town. It's pretty rough. And he said, I will never, never judge any city in America when I come from where I come from. He says, you wouldn't be ashamed of this at all. He said, this is like the beautiful compared to where I come from. Telling you, I'm proud to be an American, but I'm also proud to be a Christian and know that even though I love living in America, it's not my home. Even though the government may do things that they shouldn't do, even though they vote in and allow things and make things the law, and one day they're going to come in here and they're going to say, You can't preach against this and this and this, even though the Bible says it's sin. That's okay because this is not my home. I'm going to go to a home, I'm telling you. My home is, is there, there's gates of pearl. The streets are paved with gold. I don't mean gold filling, I mean pure gold. And I don't believe it's a thin layer, I believe it's solid, thick gold. Why do we need gold when we're dead? I believe in my mansion there's going to be a fountain that flows with Dr. Pepper. Tonight, as we close our service tonight, I want us to take some time. And, and as we come to the altars or there at your, your pew, wherever that you want to, I want you to think about it just for a second. We did for the teenagers one time, not, not here, but we've done other churches. We give them self-evaluation where they check off. I read the Bible, I do this.
this. I talk like this. I, and then I mean, kind of a self-evaluation. But tonight, I kind of want you to do it yourself. I want you to just think about it. What, what in the past week have I done that would reflect Jesus? What in the past week have I done that would reflect the Lord? And see, I don't care what was 10 years ago. That's, you know, God forgives you that. I'm, but today, yesterday, Friday, Thursday, what did I do? What if someone who looked at me and didn't know if I was a Christian or not, would they say that person is a Christian? Would I have presented a picture of Christ to them? When I was spraying houses, I walked in the house and, 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 and the man greeted me at the door and he said, hey, pastor. And I said, oh, how do you know I'm a pastor? And he said, well, your boss told me. I said, okay. He said, I feel a little bit different knowing there's a pastor in the house. I feel like we should tidy up a little bit. I said, no, don't worry about that. But that's, that's how when people look at us, they should know, hey, they're a Christian. There's something different about it. They know we go to church. I promise you, they know you go to church. But do they think they really go to church or do they think they just go down there because they do? Does their life reflect? Yeah. And then think about, hey, what can I do tomorrow? Tomorrow's a new day. When I get up tomorrow, when I talk to somebody, when I go to the store, when I go to work, when I go to school this week, when I when I go out, will my life, will it, will it look like Christ? Will, will they say, oh, okay, this person's a Christian. I need to clean my language. I need, I need to act a little different because they live like Christ. One of the greatest compliments I ever got in my life is when I graduated high school on my graduation day, I was just standing around like we all were after graduation. And this young man walked up to me. Let me tell you what this man did. He went in the Air Force. In 2003, he was flying bombers over Iraq, dropping bombs on Iraq. This man retired from the military just a few years ago which made me jealous that he's already retired same age as me he turned out to, he was a great man turned into a great soldier a hero but on graduation day he walked up to me and he says he says man thank you I said what for I said, you know he was a great football player and he's well known popular kid really good I said what for he said because every Monday you was in that music room leading Bible study he said, there was only one or two in there, and I didn't come all the time. He said, but you showed me what it's like to live as a Christian. He said, no, I'm not going to let that. He said, I'm, I'm going to let that affect me for the rest of my life. I saw him a few years later, and I said, are you still living with Jesus? Yes, I am. And I said, like I said, he flew a bomber over Iraq. I mean, this guy was all that. He was, you know, Captain America. That's the greatest compliment I've ever been given. It wasn't after some great sermon where I got some great accolades or some, you know, thousands of people came and got said, no, it was one man, one boy in high school that said, you showed me how to live as a Christian. Yeah. Not that I'm anything. God be the glory for that. Yeah. So I didn't think I was living like a Christian all that great. But he said, man, you showed me how to live. That's, that's what I want people to think. That's what I want people to say. You show me how to live as a Christian. Your picture on your passport in this world showed it reflected Christ. Not, not the world, not, not somebody who just goes to church to go to church, but you reflected Christ. And I'll be rewarded for that one day. I'll be judged for that one day. You'll be judged one day for what you reflect in this world. And so let's take a few moments. I want to pray before we do that. But I want us to just take a few moments and I want us to examine what our passport might look like and what we need to do to change it, what we can do to change it. You may look at it and say, hey, I think I'm doing all right. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Not, if, you're, if your passport looks great, man, ask the Holy Spirit, don't let this change. Because you know what? The enemy's going to come in, but my Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Holy Spirit raises up a standard against it. And my passport may look good, but I know the enemy's coming, but I need the Holy Spirit to protect me against it. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, I thank you for this people. Lord, I thank you for their willingness to be here on Sunday night. Lord, I'm looking at their picture and I'm seeing Christians because they took time out on Sunday night to come to your house to worship you, to be in your presence. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, as we, as we examine ourselves, Lord, I pray that you show us ways that we need to, to, to help make sure our passport, our picture of, that Peter tells us we're foreigners, God. We, we've got to look different than this world. We're not of this world. We live in it, God, but we're just, we're just here for a, part, uh, for a time. And Lord, we need to reflect Jesus, not this world, not those around us. Lord, I pray that you'd show us, allow your Holy Spirit to come and show us 
things that we need to do to change our appearance, God. And I pray as we leave this place, we look different than we did when we came here because we've spent time in your presence. We've spent time in your house, God. We love you. Hallelujah. With every head bowed, every eye closed, before we come and pray, I want to ask this question tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you've heard me talking about passport. You don't, maybe you're thinking that's weird, but, but you're here tonight and you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart. I'm telling you, if your picture on your passport would reflect not a Christian, but a, a sinner, someone of this world, and you'd say, I want to change that. I don't want, I don't want God to look at me and see a sinner or someone of this I want God to look at me and see someone who's been redeemed, who's been bought by the blood of Jesus, someone who's accepted that salvation, and there's no cost for it, there's no price. It's already been paid. All you have to do tonight is simply accept the gift that God has given you through Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you say, I need that salvation. I need Jesus because I belong to the world and I don't want to. I want to belong to Jesus. I want all the blessings. I want all the, the things that he gives me which is salvation, which is hope in the future, which is heaven. If you're here tonight, if you just lift your hand up. You say, I need salvation. I need Jesus in my life. You lift your hand up. Just put it right back down. I need to change my picture to look and reflect Jesus. You just lift your hand up. Put it right back down. Amen. Praise God. If you would stand with me, everybody, tonight. Hallelujah. Let's just find a place tonight to pray. Let's spend a few moments tonight looking at our passport picture, looking at what we look like. I know some, this is symbolism, and some of you may be thinking that's weird. But if you really think about it, what does the world see in me? Do they see Christ? Do they see me? Do they see the world? Let's just take a few moments tonight. Let's just find a place to pray.